So I'd like to welcome Catherine to the stage. Take it away. Thank you so much. And I, I want to say thank you to everybody out there who's uh, watching us and joining us today. We know that there are a million things you could be watching. And to those of you who've been connecting and following me on, on LinkedIn, thank you so much for your notes. It's great to be here. So I want to talk to you first, introduce myself. I'm Catherine Henry. I'm an SVP at, um, at Media Monks. We are a global one of the biggest advertising companies in the world with over 8,300 people working around the, the, the world on some of the biggest brands and metaverse trends for technology companies and brands that you love since day one. That's in our DNA since, since the, the, the dawn of the internet. And they say, if it's on a screen, we make anything that happens. So that's why <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you about the metaverse and what we're doing in that space, because we've been working in this, as I said, since uh, quite some time. And so the first thing to start with is what is the metaverse? A lot of people are really sort of confused about that. And for us, it's really the next logical stage of the internet, it's web three, it's virtualization. Basically you're taking everything and you're putting it onto this now virtual internet. So if you can imagine in day one, you thought, do I have to put my paper and my pages and all of my reports onto this internet? Who's even there? Why do they read it? I'm very good with my yellow pages. Well, now it's that same question that a lot of people are saying, why do I need to be in the metaverse? And what's the benefit? Who's there? And so we have to think about in the same way that we made that transition back in the 1990s, how virtualization is going to enable us to do things differently and hopefully much better. So we say it's the process of virtualization of getting onto this 3D internet and it's inevitable. And so a lot of people, when they think about going into the metaverse, they do it in three different ways. The first is FOMO, right? So basically it's the, um, it's the, it's the metaverse is a place we need to be, but we don't really know much about it. The second one is that it presents a threat to our company or we feel like it's an opportunity. And for a lot of retail companies, that's absolutely the case is they're thinking, hey, how can I get on in this? And the same thing with entertainment we saw over the past two years, they thought, okay, people can't go to physical locations. So now we want to go to these virtual spaces. And then finally, it's a fundamental p &L change. And that's for big companies in manufacturing, aeronautics, uh, aerospace, you name it. And they're all um, thinking about ways that they can be much more efficient in the metaverse and also bring proto product prototypes in, through their pipelines a lot faster. But today, I want to focus in on uh, the, the metaverse and really the new tools and technologies. The reason why it's happening now, people are saying, you know, what makes now an urgent time? And we're saying it's because we have technologies that enable us to do things in a way we never could before. The computing power of our phones, thanks to 5G, is so powerful that we're able to download information and to see things virtually in a way we were not before. And there are a number of technologies that are enabling this new um, 3D immersive web. And one of the terms that Mark Zuckerberg uses is the embodied web. And I like that a lot. Um, it's because you can physically be in there and move. And that changes the dynamics about how we do everything. So a couple of things are, um, one of the things about this is with this new media, we have new rules. Because we have got engagement in the, in the sports, in the space, and we have entertainment. And so we need to reimagine our brands as activities because we've got new consumer expectations. They're used to using these, these technologies. And so the faster they learn to use it, the more they're starting to think, hey, what else can we do? And it's almost like um, it's edge computing, but in the consumer sense, the consumers are pushing us always to the edges to try to figure out, it's almost like breaking a game for those of you who are game players out there. You want to push your user experience to the edge and really figure out what else you can do with these amazing technologies. And so we're seeing the emergence of multiple new business models and new platforms in the same way that we saw these things emerge every time we have a new technology, not just with um, you know, your flat screen PC, suddenly people added rich videos and rich media. And the same thing with apps on our iPhone. Suddenly we could order pizza or get a ride to the airport by a total stranger. So it's transforming the way we do business and specifically the entertainment business. This are two clips from some of our work. We did uh, a huge online concert for 
Pokemon, well, Pokemon, Malone is Post Malone for Pokemon. And uh, we did interactive work with Lady Gaga. And the future of entertainment is really interactive and you are going to be featured in it. And it's driven very much by, again, the users and what they wanna do in the space. So when we talk about the metaverse for entertainment, we're also talking a number of trends that are emerging. And those trends you can see on here, we're gonna deep dive a little bit deeper into what they are. The first one is entertainment. What it is, is basically unlimited seats, always a full house, your links to social platforms, exclusive VIP events, after parties, merchandise, meet and greet, microtransactions. In other words, there are unlimited ways to expand your business in entertainment in these new virtual spaces. Because it's really about building excitement with interactions that go beyond the real world. In other words, you can, um, you can continue to build, uh, you can continue to build experiences that are very dynamic and um, can really engage people in ways that they could not before. And importantly, it's no longer on one platform. So for example, what if you could have a virtual concert across Roblox, Twitch, Fortnite, and Rec Room, and have an after party at Sandbox or VR Chat? We're actually working on something like that. And it's just the beginning of, I think, these multi-platform experiences where you're able to engage um, people in a dynamic way. And also think about that from a revenue standpoint, how you could really maximize your presence across all of these things. Now, it's also very social. From a social standpoint, the, uh, the metaverse is really about connecting deeper with your fans. And so each one of these touch points, I mentioned a couple, a couple different platforms, there are communities there. And so the idea is to really deep, have a deeper connection with the audience across these communities. And so they inhabit these platforms. They, you know, they, they build, you know, they're in these worlds, they're building them. And they're also like really exploring their lives and they're bringing a bridge between the physical, you know, what they're doing in, in the real world and the digital world. So in Second Life, for example, a platform that's just been reignited by its founder, Philip Rosedale, you know, they're, they've got, a core following of people who spend lots of money as if they do in the real world on real world things and they really do consider it their second life. So the question is, is if you're a brand or if you're an, an entertainment franchise, where would you start? What platform, what community would you want to tap in? And what products would you bring in? And what activities? So you really need to think about this as if you were starting a business in the real world, but here in a virtual realm. So when it comes to retail and merchandise, the future of retail experience is also changing. If you're in this embodied internet, are you gonna really replicate it in the real world as you, would, <laughs> as you would online? I've seen instances of that and I wouldn't recommend it because really you want to think about what that new experience is in, in a world where merchandise is virtual. I say, what can't it do? In other words, if instead of walking in your shoes, you can jump over buildings with them with flames shooting out of the back of the sneakers. Instead of wearing a jacket, you can open it and fly. Um, and that jacket can also get you into VIP events if it's a special type of jacket or limited edition jacket or an NFT. So we can also conversely with the, with, uh, the metaverse create special effects on real clothing in the physical world. And again, that's, that's bridging it with NFTs. So um, these two examples of things that we've done, Complex Land, you can actually order pizza in the, in, the, in the virtual world and it would come visit you, or sorry, it could come to your door in the real world. Similarly, um, you know, we, we do special things where you can have access to special events. If you are, say, a loyal member of a club or uh, you have a very close relationship, and I outlined some of these kind of links between utility, in other words, these physical, physical world benefits and digital objects in the uh, book that I did, or actually it's a, uh, an intelligence report called uh, Branded NFTs and it's on LinkedIn. So if you're looking at different strategies, a lot of them are there. Speaking of which, so we're seeing an evolution of NFTs. Now, a lot of people, I call it the gateway drug to the metaverse. A lot of people say NFTs are, um, are leading us into the metaverse. And I would say 
it's it's a parallel trend and it's not necessarily the metaverse because the metaverse has many other aspects to it of which this is one. This is a one way in which people are utilizing what I call treasure in the attic. They realize that because you can finally take these digital assets and lock them, effectively you just heard everything about them, but because you can take these assets and lock them and trade them, they have value. And so there's a lot of talk about NFTs right now. From an entertainment perspective, what I want to say is that it can be very, it can significantly boost a client's profile and income across multiple platforms. So the collecting objects and moments from fans, from physical merchandise can be mementos. Um, it could be iconic moments in film, like little video clips. And it opens collectibles to a whole new range of potential buyers. So instead of the, the fan that might stand outside the backstage door and like ask for an autograph and then maybe resell it on eBay, you now open it up to a whole new group of collectors who can cash in on that celebrity. Another thing for entertainment is the venues. So whether it's Caesars Palace or Madison Square Garden or the Hollywood Bowl, all of these real world spaces will have virtual equivalents. Um, and I add the sphere because I just love the MSG sphere and that's in the lower right hand corner. It's another um, type of venue that we can expect to see in the future where will really um, capitalize on the trend towards 3D virtual ex embodied experiences. And the difference here, again, when we think about how entertainment is changing in the future, we have to think about the way fans are going to be engaging. It changes from seeing and hearing to interacting. It changes from sitting or standing at a concert to actually playing and moving and participating in the concert. So we need to think about the, the way we design these experiences for um, for celebrities, for our brands, for our uh, for our events in this three D world. So the question is, if you're looking at platforms, are you looking at a pop up or permanent residence, and who are you trying to reach in what community? And so again, a lot of the things that we would think about when we choose whether it's Caesar's Palace or maybe the Ritz <laughs> downtown in in your city, some small you know cool bar, you also have to think about who you're trying to reach. And that goes for the future of music too. So we have music, it's really migrating onto these platforms. Again, we talked about um, entertainment and, but you know, there are a lot of really cool things that the people are doing, even NFTs of sounds. Ferrari, interestingly, has created an NFT for the sound of its motor. So the future of music is also changing and the way we experience it is linking it also to visual experiences in the, in the way they did in the early days of MTV. So um, we, we want to think about different ways of telling these stories and communicating with people and letting them also participate in the creative expression around their interpretation of sound. Um, we talked about sporting events, uh, sorry, venues before, and sports events will also open to a global audience. Imagine everybody has a front row seat. So again, the type of engagement moves from seeing and hearing to interacting, from watching to playing and monitoring. In real time, you can get data all around, you can get stats, you can pull up all sorts of other information. And already in Facebook or now Meta, you can go into the headset, the VR headset or online, um, and access via your PC or mobile. And you can experience sports as if you were in the front row. And for those of you who are in advertising, know too that wherever anybody's seated, you've got dynamic advertising. So no matter where anybody is, they can really see your ads. So we have recreated you know, a legendary sports figure in, um, in VR to your right. You can see Bob Paisley, who was a famous figure in UK sports. And we also created NBA. And if you have you if you have access to the uh, to an Oculus headset, you can see the NBA in VR on the weekends. So check them out. So I just want to leave some hypothetical case for you. Can you imagine what if everything that is happening in the stadium all around you virtually, and everybody has access to digital feeds? So that means that the stadium would no longer be the, for the physical people had, you know, physical tickets, but you could have 
to see it's anywhere. And so imagine, you know, you could be right up the court side or you can have like a little bit elevated. And um, we're seeing that a lot of people invest very heavily into these opportunities. I'm gonna run through a couple more and, and then take any questions, but um, virtual humans and influencers for entertainment, this is important because the, you know, you can have virtual influencers who look like humans, but they're not. And we also have human influencers who take digital form. And that's a massive thing. Know that they can be very valuable. So if you're in entertainment, know that Jennifer Aniston's dog has, you know, she's in the lower, lower right, right hand. She's got uh, an avatar that of her dog. And her dog now has its own social feed. So there are ways of amplifying your access to audiences. And we're seeing it become much more all-inclusive, every shape and size and you know, imaginable configuration of, of humans. Importantly, the celebrity double is a thing. And there are a lot of people who are, for example, Ima walked, walked to the street, the uh, New York Fashion Week this, this week, last week. And she is, um, she is a virtual human like Lil Michaela on the screen. She doesn't exist and yet she has over 3 million followers and over 12 million in brand endorsements annually. The great thing is, you know, she can be anywhere. She's never tired. She can speak any language fluently. She can be, she's without scandal. She's always a size two or four or eight or whatever you want to make her. And so, and she can interact with brands across platforms 24 seven. Importantly too, with CGI, we can put her in different places. So she can be on, she can sing in a, in a, in a music video or she can text to people automatically in, um, on Instagram. Know too that this is really important because virtual influencers have a very long reach. So for example, many um, virtual influencers have a higher engagement rate than real influencers. So if you look to the lower right hand, a study by Hype Auditor showed that in the 1,000, 5,000 category, basically a micro influencer, a virtual influencer would have over 12 times engagement rate. Whereas um, in the higher category, it's still very a notable outperformance because in the people who have their macro influencers over 1 million followers, it has over three times the engagement reach. So that's real money, that's a real reach. And in 2018, um, in Japan, there were about 200 virtual celebrities, and yet by 2021, there were over 9,000. They are very popular and people like engaging with them. Sometimes they don't know they're human and sometimes they just don't care, but know that they are very effective either way. So this is a really important generational moment, I would say, um, to join the metaverse, and especially for entertainment. And it is very, uh, it's an exciting space to be in, especially um, if you're looking at thinking about new ways of reaching a broader audience or engaging the with the IP and the celebrities that you represent. So I hope that's given you some food for thought. And uh, yeah, thanks for your time. So this is amazing. And you do have some questions in the chat, but first I'd like to ask you a question. Um, what is the current discussion around the area of ethics in all of this? Um, who is talking about ethics and what are the issues? Because when you start bringing in synthetic characters, you also get into that whole line of what's marketing, what's propaganda, um, what is ethical activity, that sort of thing. Can you talk about that? You do. We're still in early days, and I think that you know we will probably evolve some sort of system like the Twitter, where you've got a blue check or something similar. At the moment, it's really not problematic because they're primarily across established social networks, and therefore they do have to have the same kind of clearance. And so they are. Um, this is a, a, a regulated thing. It's not like it's not anonymous. So when they are registered, they are registered, and some digital influencers have been removed from platforms because they were they didn't conform to platform standards so for the moment i wouldn't worry about it i wouldn't go dystopian just yet okay taraj in the chat is asking if you have recommendations for which metaverses to uh to enter into if you're trying to create a presence for a company Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really strategic decision. And so that's why I tell people to think about it is if you, you know, every community, imagine 
if I were a European brand, let's just say I'm a French fashion house and I want to move to, you know, I want to open up a shop in, in, in the States. Would I start with Philadelphia? Would I start with, I don't know, Oklahoma? Uh, or would I go to New York? And so the question is, you know, so you really think about your demographic and it's the same thing that you would do. And even if you go to New York, do you want to be uptown, sort of closer to Central Park and Fifth Avenue, or do you want to be in Brooklyn, which is way hipper? So I think that we need to think about, you know, think about the demographics of the metaverse very much in the same way. Where is your demographic? Where's your community? Go someplace that's authentic where people are going to embrace you and give them something to do. Again, you are there to attract them. They're already there. So what are you going to do to make it worth their while to engage with you as a brand? Okay. Asher is asking about the Uncanny Valley. I'll just read this. Do you Hi, think Asher. the- Hi, Asher. Hi, Oh, do you want to read it? Can you see it? <laughs> I can see it. Okay. Uh, the Uncanny Valley Hard Line work with creating the metaverse and creating content. Um, I think that right now, what's exciting about the technology is that we are evolving to a higher sense of reality. So we are able to see, I mean, you do lose your sense of self in, in the metaverse. And I know that when I put on headset and I lose myself into VR, I absolutely love it. And I feel very much at home there. And I know that people feel that they're finding their tribe, their community, they're able to express themselves in a way that they couldn't in the real world. And that's a really exciting space. So I feel as though that for many people, it's liberating. They can be whoever they wanna be and they can somehow be seen for the way they wanna be, be seen in, the, in, in this world. They could be much bigger, much stronger. They could be small and, and delicate. I remember once I was in a room and I was kind of in this boyish skeleton character and I turned to a tiny little fairy, this delicate little thing. It was like a Japanese anime, but very beautiful. And I said, excuse me, do you know the exit? And it replied to me, no, I don't know. <laughs> so it just goes, neither one of us was who we seemed. And it was kind of wonderful. I loved that moment. So I think that there is an opportunity to, um, to really, unleash this new possibility to engage with the world with your authentic self. Fantastic. If somebody, if oh. somebody is behind Lil. Oh, yes. Um, earlier today, we had Ed Sachi talk about what he's doing with Fable Studio and Lucy. And one of the things they're doing is you have a relationship with Lucy, this artificial intelligence driven character. And she learns from you, which means that Lucy can develop in a billion different ways because there are a billion people on the planet. Are you yet seeing companies using AI in ways that allow for individualized marketing and communication, or is it still mass communication? Yeah, thank you. Um, that actually ties into the question that, uh, that Toraj asked earlier, that you know, are these effectively run by, by AI? Are they autonomous? AI is very helpful for maybe chat, rooms that's that sort of thing and say for at the moment um but we have seen very recent experiences that the, that ai can evolve depending on what it's being trained on and it needs to be trained on massive amounts of data and or conversations and it can it, it can go in different directions what i will say that from the moment most of these are driven by prompted responses and conversations. And so it's used for these virtual avatars or virtual humans um, in chat spaces like Instagram or something to respond to fans instead of having 12 assistants try to answer. So that works pretty well. But for the most part, most of the posts are very heavily constructed. They have a team of people behind them, and they usually use a, um, a, a physical human who then puts on the clothes and takes on the thing, and then they, they just map the, the um, avatar's face on top. What I would also say is for business, don't give up on the metaverse for business if you have just tried one platform or another. It's a journey. And sometimes it's, you know, you can go inside and there will be people who will take people on tours or there are different ways of exploring multiple platforms. There are discord groups that can tell you which are the best experiences. So that's a great way if you don't have 
you know, a, a, an advisor, or if you don't have access to an, <laughs> a big ad agency like ours to help you understand what that looks like. But also feel free that if you are working with a, a company and you're trying to figure it out, invite some advisors to come in and say, okay, this is your, this is where you are, and this is these are the considerations for you. And we'll generally map it out um, pretty specifically to the major trends that you need to be looking at. And then based on those, you can come away and make your own determination. But if you have three or four of those, you'll probably have a pretty good idea of, of things that you need to think about. But as I said before, it's not really, um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not optional. You know, just as people were looking at the early web, yeah, sure, there were hold, holdouts, but it's kind of ultimately, who's not on the web now or who's, who doesn't have a digital presence. And so we are headed towards the metaverse. So the sooner you jump in and you know get used to what it can do, the better for everybody. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. This was amazing. Really thank appreciate you. it. And if people have additional questions, put them in the chat and we'll forward them right. on to Catherine. And I would just like to say that if anybody wants, I have done a number of primers. I call their intelligence reports. I go deep dives into NFTs for branding, deep dive on what is the metaverse. Um, I had a whole deck on, um, on avatars and human influencers. So if you go into my LinkedIn, please connect, say hi, and participate in the conversation. Because I also say what's new, what's exciting, what's important in the metaverse and why it matters. So I like to, to keep it as inclusive as possible and I would love to stay in touch. So please connect and I will, you know, I'll happily share with you all the decks that we've, I've produced. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank my you. Pleasure.